um, yeah, so thanks uh, everyone for being here. And uh, thank you especially for Tamara Toledo and Sarah Shamash for curating the exhibition. To Cecily Yu for all her support with the exhibition and artist, uh, curate, you know, organizing the exhibition and the artist talk. Um, and it's a pleasure to share this talk with Amanda Gutierrez, my fellow presenter and a very close collaborator. Um, so as Tamara was saying, I was born in the city of Guadalajara, Mexico, where all my family uh, and my really close network of friends uh, still live and who I have the privilege to visit regularly. And I arrived to the traditional territories of many indigenous nations known as Takaronto in Eastern Canada as an international student almost 25 years ago without any intention of staying in these lands. Uh, but life happened and I stayed and I have been occupying the stolen lands of the Coast Salish people since 2003, where I'm connecting from and where I have been privileged and extremely grateful to um, raise my daughter and make a family for her. So uh, today I will talk to you about some of the ideas behind the interactive video art installation, Remediating Mama Pina's Cookbook and the website that it accompanies it, uh, focusing on how these two projects have shaped my art practice, my scholarly research on feminist media histories, and my overall approach to feminist research creation methodologies. So over the last 20 years, I've produced uh, a series of video art installations through which I investigate the female body, or more specific, my body, as a site of cultural, gender, and biopolitical inscriptions. Um, in other words, uh, I've been exploring how the body acts as an archive of all our experiences and how in turn we embody and enact those experiences in our daily lives. After spending a couple of years working as an independent artist and a graphic designer, my interest in archives and history grew and I joined the PhD program at the University of British Columbia where I investigated the practices of a group of artists and feminist activists who began to question how feminine bodies were visually construed and politicized across media in the context of the emergence of transnational new wave feminisms in the 1970s. I conceptualized their media works, including installation, performance, video, 16 and 80 millimeter film as archival practices, that is, as daily acts of collecting and recording information about their activisms and their life in general. I turned my dissertation into a monograph that was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2019 and was recently translated into Spanish in 2022. To develop this project, I spent over a year traveling and doing research in Mexico City between 2009 and 2010, where I visited different institutional archives and interviewed several artists and scholars including Monica Mayer, Maris Bustamante, Rosa Marta Fernandez, Ana Victoria Jimenez, Magali Bar Lara, Eli Bartra, uh, and many others. I also learned about Karen Cordero and Monica Mayer's curatorial project that sought to reactivate Ana Victoria Jimenez archive through intergenerational workshops with artists and students, and how these activities led to the exhibition Mujeres y que más, and eventually to the donation of Jimenez's collection of photographs and ephemera to the special collections of the library at Ibero University in Mexico City. The time I spent doing research in Mexico inspired me to begin to question traditional conceptions of what an archive is, who defines it, and who decides what to include in it. These experiences have led me to explore archival practice as a methodology for feminist research creation centered on the recovery of political memory through reactivation, reenactment, and remediation. Three methodologies that I continue to explore at the Critical Media Arts Studio, or CMAS, a research and creation studio that I lead at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology, where I have developed a series of interactive art projects in collaboration with many artists and scholars, as well as publications that foreground the contributions of women and the ways in which technology shapes our sense of self. In CMAS, we work through the lens of research creation because it allows us to experiment and theorize about the implications of working across media and disciplines. So returning to the time that I was doing research in Mexico City, um, I also gave birth to my only daughter. And the experience of being a mother for the first time while encountering the generosity of many artists and scholars who share their stories, their personal archives, and open their homes to me, 
inspired me to investigate my own family archives and especially to think about what forms of female socialization I had inherited and I was going to pass down to my daughter and mostly how I was going, going to pass them down while raising her in another country as a bilingual and a bicultural child. So I remember my great grandmother's cookbook that my mother and I used when we used to bake together when I was still living in Mexico. I began to look at the cookbook, not as a recipe book, uh, but as an archive of family traditions, values, affects, and mostly as a technology that was used by three generations of women in my family to record female reproductive labor and gender behavior norms. Mama Pina, my great grandmother, began to handwrite recipes on this notebook around 1918 and then handed down to my grandmother Gabriela and her twin sister Teresa, who continued to write cooking recipes and knitting instructions on the book. At some point, as we see here, a calligraphy notebook of one of my uncles was glued to the initial notebook and it was incorporated as part of the recipe book. Then it was passed down to my mother, whose name is also Gabriela, and who also wrote recipes in the notebook. The notebook also contains records of other forms of writing, as I mentioned, um, also scribbling and doodling, possibly done by other children in the many households the recipe book inhabited. Many of its pages are covered with smears and stains of food, others are ripped. Each recipe contains traces of domestic habits and economies, as well as material remains of lived experiences. For example, some of the pages, as I said, are smeared with grease or leftovers from food. Other recipes require ingredients that no longer exist, such as tor una, tor una tortuga en lata or a turtle in a can, and list quantities that are no longer calculable, such as dos centavos de azúcar de la tendita, or two cents of sugar from the corner store. So I began to reflect on all the things that were recorded in the notebook and the different technologies of recording that were employed and taking inspiration from Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin's concept of remediation, which they define as quote, the logic by which new media forms refashion prior media forms, end quote. I invited several colleges, colleagues sorry, and friends to respond in the media of their choice to a recipe included in the notebook. So the responses I received included digital images, audio recordings, videos, and documentation of family gatherings and conversations. The responses reactivated the handwritten record while unpacking its absences and creating new experiences and connections that remediated the recipes via digital communication technology. For example, Alessandro Santos baked the Russian Charlotte or La Carlota Rusa and documented the process with photography. She also reinterpreted and wrote the recipes as a poem and shared the song Sin Receta or Without Recipe by her friend Jose Miguel Wisnik. Sarah Shamash created a video with found footage inspired by Mama Pina's strawberry pudding recipe. In the video, Sarah reflects on how her mother passed down many interesting things to her, but not the habit of cooking. Rafael Santana cooked up a digital version of the shrimp salad recipe from a Mapinas cookbook by sourcing 3D renderings found on the web and putting them together to make a graphic collage. Claudia Irvin Little and her family got together to bake the cornbread or torta de lote. Um, and Claudia wrote a first person account of the experiences that her mother, Esther, her sister Marina, and her niece Dalia had baking the cord bread. Alejandra Brothman got together with her mother, Marina, her daughters, Maya and Nina, and her partner, Alec, to bake pancakes from Mama Pina's cookbook. Alejandra produced an audio recording of the process, and Alec took photos and made a video. Laura Madocoro and her partner Tom got together to cook potato cakes inspired by Cakes para el Desayuno in Mama Pina's cookbook and also reflected in, on how in their family's cookies, cooking was passed down by, the, by their fathers and not by their mothers. So the first iteration of remediating Mama Pina's cookbook, I'm going to let it play a little bit. Manteca, una taza, harina, dos tazas, rollar, una cuchara. 
So I'm gonna lower the volume, but this is the first iteration of remediating Mama Pina's cookbook, which consists of a four channel video art installation. Um, and for the second iteration of the project, I created a, a website that contains the responses to the cookbook and the transcriptions and the scans of the pages of the book that was included as part of a special edition of the Feminist Media Histories Journal on Feminist Data. So I'll play two more seconds with sound. <laughs> So the first video in the installation records my attempts at learning different handwriting styles of the four women who wrote in the book. The second video features myself cooking one of the recipes, polvorones rusos, while my mother reads the recipe to me via Skype with the help of my nephew, Pablo Ignacio. They are in Mexico and I'm in Canada baking. And the third video consists of mapping and documenting the collaborations of friends and colleagues who were invited to respond to some of the recipes uh, from the cookbook. And the fourth video is an interactive video channel that invites viewers to write responses to one of the recipes in the cookbook using a stylus pen or a mouse. These responses are not recorded, but slowly disappear as the user types or draws onto the image as a way to reflect on the anarchival properties of all archives. So the website also contains an index of all the pages in the notebook, which have been scanned and also links to all the responses. It also includes an interactive version of the video that showcases the, the collaborations of all the my collaborators in the book. Oh, sorry, I just lost my mouse and I'm trying to make it work. Oh, oh sorry. Um, and by reflecting how this recipe book was in fact an archive of sorts in which three generations of women in my family had recorded instructions on how to cook, but also about feminine feminine rituals and traditions. With this project, I began to theorize on the role of women as agents of the archive, a concept de developed by Kate Aidhorn, and also expanded the notion of Meyer and um, Karen Cordero's reactivation by including uh, digital uh, technologies. And I mostly I began to think about um, uh, how I was replicating the collaborative and haphazard methodology of writing, making, cooking, baking, tracing, sharing, and using different modes of recording proposed by all the authors of Mama Pina's cookbook. And so drawing from the work of Rebecca Schneider and Diane Taylor, who are interested in looking at the tensions between performative forms and recorded forms of knowledge as they are passed down from generation to generation, I observed that this tensions were present in the in my great grandmother's recipe book. And this led me to explore the potential of reenactment to further investigate what Taylor characterizes as the tensions between the archive of supposedly enduring materials, that is texts, bones, buildings, and monuments, and the so-called ephemeral repertoire of embodied practices or embodied knowledge of oral traditions, sports, cooking, rituals, and etc. So um, I started again thinking of reenactment and um, understood as an, uh, I, 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 adding to remediation, I started thinking about reenactment, which is understood as an artistic and historical practice to visualize and contemporize the past. And one that focuses primarily on recreating events and creating them anew. And for Tommy de France and Gustavo de Frutado, the main characteristic of reenactment is the creation of, this, of a disturbance in the perceived linearity of time. And as they explain, quote, through corporeal repetition, the past gains a ghostly simultaneity with the present, and every repetition harbors the possibility of difference. That is, the possibility that the past may yet have another future, end quote. So in the process of creating Remediating Mama Pina's cookbook, has been foundational to the ongoing development of a methodology of feminist research creation that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation and which I've been um, 
putting into practice and developing along with a wide group of collaborators. This methodology builds on the concept of reactivation, understood as a call of to action that seeks to intervene in the present through the reactivation of political memory, through intergenerational and creative engagements as developed by Mayer and Cordero's feminist curatorial practice. It expands Bolter and Grusin concept of remediation by understanding it as a critical engagement with the so-called units of digital technology while exploring the ways in which these technologies facilitate preservation and communication, while at the same time considering how digital technologies deeply transform our sense of self and reproduce longstanding systems of oppression. And finally, it takes on reenactment as an invitation to stage embodied and collaborative encounters and to recreate events as a way to give our past the possibility of other futures, as the France and Frutado put it. So I would like to end by showing some of the collaborative projects that I have developed in collaboration with many other artists and scholars, which have been deeply informed by the methodology uh, and the experiences working with Mama Pina's cookbook. And so first, this is our project, The Real, The Virtual, and The We, uh, which reenacted one of Ligia Clark's best known performances, The I, The You, Clothing, Body Clothing from 1967. And we did this to explore how Clark approaches were relevant at a time when our social interactions are increasingly mediated through digital technologies and when the limits of our real and virtual bodies are constantly being blurred. This project consists of a live performance, digital video, and an AI-generated video. Similar to Mama Pina's cookbook, uh, the real, the virtual, and the we casted a network of collaborations and relations between artists and publics to reimagine a past, but in this case, added computational algorithms as an integral agent and mediator of human and own human relations. The integration of AI has led to a series of collaborative projects with Stevie Paola, Prophecy Sun, and Freya Zinoviev, in which we use the female body inscribed by the live experience of childbearing as a metaphor to reflect on the idea of the body as an interface between self and the other. In other works, sorry, this one has sound too. In other works such as this one, and we have explored the boundaries between biological and the digital by cultivating bacteria from our skin and from domestic and natural landscapes and incorporating images of this process into AI generated videos. In this case, this was um, projected in the urban screen at the Surrey Art Gallery. And most recently in the series Mitochondrial Ontologies, the time up. And the digital, we employ the concept of mitochondria as a metaphor to point to the possibility of tracing material lineages of human and unhuman bodies across time to reference information flows across bodies, machines, and geographies. This project involves a team of 10 artists working together to develop a, co a collective choreography uh, for a live performance. Um, they, 10 artists are also collecting images from the process of culturing bacteria, also from domestic spaces. And finally, the objective is to produce another AI generative uh, installation, such as the one you saw previously. And what you're looking at is a website in which we've archived all the different uh, workshops and side projects that the artists have individually work on as part of this um, workshop series that we've created for to develop the choreography for the live performance. Um, and lastly, another avenue of collaboration that is inspired by Mama Pina involves my interest on sound, art, and Latin American composers, which has led to numerous collaborations with a group of sound artists and activists who are interested in the capacity of the sonic to build intersectional, effective, and supportive networks of solidarity through the concept of sonosoridad, uh, which was developed uh, by Amanda Gutierrez, um, who is a very close collaborator, and we see here. And what you see here is one of the 
most recent installations that we develop in collaboration with other six artists. Um, and so I think it's a really great way to segue into Amanda's presentations. But before I do so, I want to share the names of all my collaborators with whom all this work will not be possible. And so thank you very much. And I look forward to your discussion. And I just wanted to share the link to see the Remediating Mama Penis Cookbook project. Thank you. And as, long, as, long, as soon as I get hold of my mouse, I will stop sharing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, my... There. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, now, Tamara will introduce Amanda. Yes. Thank you so much, Gabriela. That was wonderful. And of course, everybody, uh, if you have questions, we will leave it for after Amanda's uh, presentation, and then we can. Uh, dig in deep and um, ask them some questions. So now we have the pleasure to introduce Samanda Gutierrez. Samanda was born in Mexico as well, in Mexico City. She is currently based in Montreal. Gutierrez completed her MFA in Media and Performance Studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and is currently a PhD candidate at Concordia University in the Arts and Humanities doctoral program. Art residencies include FACT, Liverpool in the UK, ZKM in Germany, TAV in Taiwan, and Bolet Art Center in Spain. Gutierrez has exhibited at the Liverpool Biennial, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, Harvest Works in New York City, SBC Gallery, as well as Undefined Radio in Montreal, and Errant Body Studio Press in Berlin. So please welcome Amanda Gutierrez. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, I want to also give a very um, special thank you to, to you and also to Sarah for this opportunity, and um, also for having the chance to have a uh, complete review of the piece that I uh, currently are exhibiting in the gallery. So I'm going to start sharing my screen um, and I'm going to also be meaningful that um, I'm going to, I, I will try to show um, video and sometimes it has a little bit of hiccups, but uh, yeah, reload. And share a screen. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I hope you can see my screen right now. I'm having some issues sometimes with Google. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say while this is loading. Here you go. Uh, that I'm going to focus basically in walking in lightness and how I arrived to walking in lightness as a, as a piece. Um, I want to give a special attention to one of the writers who um, is meaningful, is really meaningful for my work and he has writing, has a writing, a specific writing about the borderlands, La Frontera, the new Mestiza, where um, focuses on migration. And these two paragraphs are very um, important for me, uh, since actually it speaks volumes of who I'm, I am right now and how I find myself within living between um, the global north and the global south. In this case, in Canada now, but I lived for 18 years in Chicago. And then before that, I, I was... Uh, Living as uh, in in Mexico in Mexico City, I grew up, born in Mexico City, and moved when I was twenty years old to Chicago. Um, and I just want to read this to make an homage to to Gloria Andalzúa. Cuando vives en la frontera, people walk through you. The wind steals your voice. You are a burra, way scapegoat, forerunner, and your race. 
half and half, both, woman and man, neither, a new gender. And I start, I'm going to start by tracking back my memory into this uh, piece, which was created in 2006, which actually, as uh, Gabriela was speaking on reenactment, is based on reenactments. I um, was a teacher, video teacher in a high school by then in Chicago. And I was able to record my students, some of my students' memories of how they crossed the border. However, I never took their video, but I was um, trying to, to understand how um, can be the best way to um, represent those voices without being, um, a, without emotionally being charged on what uh, victimizing them, but neither um, I wanted to take the power that their voices have itself and their memories. I did an archive, um, I, I won't say an archive because it was uh, not only a few voices, but several of these testimonial sort of histories that represent, they, they, they consolidate my work over the years um, as a very vast, um, approach of how we remember as immigrants or ways of traveling a way or ways of um the journey from uh moving one place to another from multiple perspectives but also multiple reasons in this case uh this is one of the reenactments so uh in the video i reenacted the voice and you could see the light back and uh, and then when you see the video, you hear the the voice, but you don't see the face. You only see the the outline of the the characters. And and this was in my during my MFA, and I uh, was very eager to understand how uh, these fictional stories, non fictional stories about migration, and especially in mass media, are portrayed. Um, either by hiding or either by uh, like cutting sections of the individual so they are anonymous. And to me, that was um, an ambivalent um, feeling uh, as a viewer because for some, in some part, they are like taking away the identity, but also we understand this identities uh, cannot be shown because it represents a lot of uh, danger for those who speak. So I was analyzing through my performance, this uh, idea of how uh, representation happens and how a representation within oral histories um, in testimonials can be traced, can be uh, exp expanded and explored. So what I did was a documentary actually of my neighborhood where I used to live, which is Pilsen, that back then, now it's extremely gentrified, but back then was one of the uh, main in, uh, ports of entry for the Mexican diaspora. So I did went to places where I was directed by other immigrants. Uh, I was living in that neighborhood, so by friends, by colleagues, by also students. And I was recording this kind of um, a visual archive of buildings have, that represented or have a meaningful and historical past for the Mexican diaspora. Um, so this is one of the steals. But what I did in for my MFA was reenacting a live performance that, uh, for one hand, had all these uh, voices and they were reenacted live by also another person, another um, Latinx person life, which differ on gender and differ of age. But that, that, that differentiation, that dissonance, it was important to me to actually create the alienation effect that Belter Brecht speaks um, in, in terms of how, how do we construct um, a documentary? How do we construct nonfiction within um, a live performance, but also how these voices have um, different forms of representations within 
um, a live uh, on stage event. And in this case, this is one of the uh, uh, characters, one kid of nine years old, who was also one of my student, my students, and, uh, and and he and his mother agreed to give me a, a brief interview of how was his everyday life in Pilsen, what he remembered the most in Pilsen, and um, in in what is the memories that he had from their his town. In many years, I work in in Pilsen as a as a teaching artist, and all my approaches of teach, uh, teaching arts in in the school in in the classroom was connecting those memories from their land within nowadays uh, or within those days the new neighborhood which is Pilsen, um, and therefore tracking memory was one of the another tracking memory. But this is an animation series was an important bridge for me to understand how immigration and memories of migrants can be represented not through um, neither their voice. In this case, I only uh, ask for uh, uh, the participants or collaborators, I will say, because for me, there were more collaborations, it's a collaboration of work um, where we share a story. So I share my story of migration. They share their story of migration. We wrote together a short essay and we draw a lot. We were drawing a lot and um, we share a lot of maps in rep visual representations. And then I did the stop motions animations within those stories, which in total were seven. So um, our, the archiving process of making that I still have those archives of um, having um, a connection with where geographically speaking, they talk about, but symbolic, symbolically speaking, where they are aiming to also hold their stories was an important um, element for me to create these animations, the stop motions animations um, that have the range from Guatemala, Taipei, um, Spain, um, uh, in United States as well. And there were friends in general who I start meeting through my through my travels or during the residencies or in Mexico as well as in Chicago. So the most of them were uh, collaborations created by friendships. And, and after the process of creating the animation, of course, I ask somebody else who have a symbolic connection with the original um, a collaborator, with the, uh, with, the co with the person who uh, provided the story to read their story. So the voice was also written by somebody else and the narratives, each animation was is seven minutes uh, to five minutes long. So there are several seven uh, animation se seven animations from this animation series that I think holds an important relationship with the archive. Another important um, um, series, video series that I want to jump into is Topografías del Tiempo, which the first one was created in Liverpool by three immigrants um, or in collaboration with three immigrants. The second one, in Mexico, in Mexico, Chicago, and the third one in Quebec, Montreal, and Montreal. And um, the interesting part of the of the first and the second one is that two of the stories that were portrayed in these triptychs were actually taken by um, an archive. Uh, the first one, which is Topografías del Tiempo, Mexico. Uh, Mexico, Chicago. One of them was an archive from the Bracero program website, and they have many, um, many testimonials of the former workers who were part of the Bracero program. And I was really fascinated because they um, were Braceros who live in Chicago and they build the, the railroad tracks and the, the railroad system from the Midwest all the way to uh, the middle of uh, United States. And then, then the other half was mostly Asians. Asians uh, also foreigner labor workers. So they met in the middle of United States through the construction of the railroad. 
And so in each of these three, they were multi-generational, also different genders and different nationalities. And to me, each of these testimonials, each of these stories that you see through the videos um, are uh, part of uh, an archive that um, in, in general is like nine different, nine different stories, nine different videos. The same uh, reenactment process as in the previous one, so I met these people, I, I did the interview, I transcribed the interview, I did the script, somebody else read the script, some other voice with the differs or some other individual that differs from gender, age, and ethnicity and race reads this uh, the script, and, but they have a connection, they have a symbolic connection. Um, for example, in this case, you can see I'm zooming in into Time Topography's Mexico, Chicago. So you can see a still picture of how the video is shown. And the most uh, of the time is landscapes without any, the still, most uh, of, of them with tons of stillness. It's, it's like just a still, maybe a movement that you can see uh, at times, but uh, in general, I'm trying to have in this uh, video series, the minimum um, of humans, no humans in general, but the mi minimum of movement, not direct sound also. For time topography is Mexico, you only see, uh, only hear the voices, the voiceover and not sound. But for Liverpool and then for, um, for Quebec and Montreal, I did, uh, I did record the, the sound field recordings that were also mixed within the video. This is a case of Oaxaca. The first person is my uncle. And my uncle moved from um, Calpulalpan de Melendez to Mexico City. The second one is uh, a person who I also met. It was a friend of, 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 of my common family, common families. And he moved from Ecatepec, Estado de Mexico to Chicago in the 80s, and then came back. And you can see also some of the of the text, this is uh, by the way, this is um, a small publication, self publication. And the third one is Chicago. And this is the um, the story that I actually acquired or uh, I actually um, extracted from the, from the, for a better use of word, uh, for the archive. And um, and and he uh, uh not, he born in nineteen seventeen no nineteen nineteen, and uh, so by the time when I did this he already passed away, um but I um um there was no direct contact with the family or anything it was just a recording of his voice so it was difficult to trace back more information or trace back this video to members of his family. And this relationship with the soundscape start growing on me and um, and also on my practice. So I'm going to make a huge jump into now the um, the piece that the you see and the exhibition that is walking in lightness. In the exercise of walking, I use the sound walk as a critical tool to analyze the urban environment, as well as a psychogeography as a vehicle to understand the aural experience. The soundscapes recorded during my sound walks are the primary medium used to connect my listening experience as an immigrant woman of color. The personal interactions and the identification of some new landmarks serve as a significant point of reflection. For me, walking in lightness was an important piece because it's the first time that, as you saw in the previous, and, and I have other, another uh, set of other uh, works that speaks in behalf or speaks from the experience of uh, other immigrants. This is the first piece that I started speaking about my own as an autobiographical experience or as a bio, uh, autobiographical um, piece, uh, essay, I will say. Um, and for me, this was a extremely important, very personal, very intimate process, but I did it through the exercise of walking. 
Um, what I did in, and this is when I moved after I was living for 18 years in Chicago, grow up in there, grow up in Pilsen, have to leave Pilsen and have another micro migration to New York um, and moving to Brooklyn. For me, it was uh, eminent to seek for the sounds of, uh, of, of, of Mexico. And in this case, um, I went to East Harlem where I started taking photographs and making an extensive archive of uh, prints, photo prints. And this is the, the case of, um, of the documentation of Sandwalk uh, in Harlem. So I hope it works. I'm going to speak while this is happening. So what I did, I was walking with headphones um, that are also binaural microphones. So they are seamless while you walk. Um, also, it records kind of like 360, they're very sensitive. But the most important part is that they are uh, recorded on embodiment side of, um, of, of, of your execution walking, right? So you can hear your breathing, you can hear your steps. And that was really important to me because I did not aim to do a documentation where my own subjectivity and my own embodiment was missing. To me, because my connection with these spaces, these um, landscapes, uh, these landmarks were very important, I wanted to have a footprint connection or a sonic footprint connection in my recording as well. So you can hear, for example, the camera cranking because I did it, this, these pictures with uh, disposable cameras. Also, I did not want to take any uh, person in front of the camera. And most of the times, um, only elements that call me or were important to me, meaningful for me in the sense of documenting kind of like my own relational connection with the space. And after this, um, then I start thinking about what it means for me to move to United States. I asked endlessly to many collaborators um, in many projects, previous projects on, on video, what it means for them to move to another country. But this time walking, uh, walking and then working at the... Um, Photographic, uh, photographic, International Photographic Art Center, because I have the residency there, I have the chance to make prints. So while I was working in the black, um, in the in the dark room, I was questioning myself why I did move to you to United States, and the question is um, present in the in the document in the uh, essay that is now exhibit in the gallery, in Sur Gallery. And basically for me was the uh, danger to exist as uh, women in, in Mexico. It's very dangerous right now, and it used to be dangerous back in 2000. And so gender violence was one of the main and most important reasons why I moved to United States. So I reflect that through not only the prints that you will see, but also in um, in the video that I um, I showed in the I'm showing in in the exhibition, which I'm just going to play the first two minutes. La exposición es determinada generalmente por dos factores, 
la duración de la luz, que es controlada por el oborturador, y el resplandor o la intensidad de la luz, que es controlada por el tamaño de la apertura de la lente. Me gusta ver el negativo de mis fotos proyectado en la ampliadora. Es como mirar un ideal, el cual trato de reproducir con innumerables pruebas, en su mayoría errores, accidentes, clones. He guardado todas mis impresiones, desde las más penosas hasta las más triunfantes. Son como generaciones de un mismo padre, madre, cultura, tratándose de adaptar a un estándar. How can anthropology define the day-by-day -day cases of feminicides in my homeland? Are we safe here? Are we safe here? Are we visible or targeted? Are we visible or targeted? I cannot express how the nights, how the were, nights so were so dark that they allow me to wake up alive. I cannot, I cannot describe, describe the feeling, the feeling of, seeing of seeing women with less luck, with less luck disappearing. disappearing. That's, that's why, why we're moving here. here. At least that's why I move here. Where there is some noise on the sidewalks. I moved, I moved here, here to feel, to feel safe. safe. To keep the ground, to as, keep my the ground as my floor. To step, step into, into my, my own history. history. To tell further generations. To tell further generations my own story. Without being an anecdote of survival. So I make uh, this relationship between the dark room as a space where I um where I was reflecting this, but also the processes of printing as the processes of adaptation, um, as a metaphor of the process of adaptation, where you are more clear, you are more visible, you are more sharp, as soon as you are adapting into uh, the light, the correct lightning, or the correct um, approximation in the lab through these chemical processes. Um, and also in relationship of myself understanding why I was, um, you know, I was, I decided to move uh, for good to to this territory. And to me, honestly, it's still being a question that I um, is still shaping and still like thinking through. It's not, it's not a in the in, in process. It's always a process that keeps evolving through many, many different um, adjustments. And to me, um, this metaphor of printing, this metaphor of creating the perfect picture is out actually very similar to the fail, the failure that I feel that I have or, or this process of fail and test that I have every time that I move to a new space in this case now and even in Montreal. And um, so I wanted to to find to find this is these questions in in and these are some of the questions the metaphor of visibility and invisibility as an immigrant in the United States what it makes us to define ourselves in a space how place making is an important factor for the visibility of our identities are these identities defined by a collective body or a collective thinking uh, or a collective also way of approaching culture. Is the immigrant body visible or invisible when it's culturally assimilated? So all these pictures that you see were pictures that I developed through the walking uh, through in, in the um, dark room, but they were pictures taken during my sound walks. And then I start working with collages. So in the first iteration of this piece, uh, they were prints, the prints that also some of the prints that you see at um, Sur Gallery are part of this body of work, but uh, these are other prints that I um, still have and uh, I develop in terms of questioning these relationships between um, placemaking and um, 
in specifically some of the observations that I had while walking in Sunset Park, Harlem, and uh, yeah, these two neighborhoods mostly. And uh, uh, for me, it was important not only questioning relationships of migration, relationships of um, taking place of a culture, but also from the gender perspective, what are those um, questions of uh, assimilating myself within the culture being uh, a Latinx? And to me, the experimental animation that you saw and, and extracts that you see during the, the video are, um, as I say here, experimental cutout animation has the possibility to link the cognitive side of the sensorial experience, of the sensory experience of the soundscape with the perceptual capabilities of abstraction for the recognition of geometry and architecture and light, subtracting and mixing them through visual techniques such as the photograph, photographs of collage. And then this is a picture only for the first iteration, but I wanna say that um, as you can see, all these pictures that you saw previously uh, in the in the sound walk, in the video sound walk were printed and, in the, and they were like probably terrible prints because I was experimenting in the lab but to me, all these experimentations of adjustment were part of the question that was rendered through the video. And also in the la during the exhibition, I used this window, the front window, as an uh, animation lab that I, um, I like constantly went to animate every day during the uh, working hours of the gallery. So I was using the gallery as a space for for this exploration and I'm going to end showing you some of these um, findings, which I really love honestly, because um, they are not defining anything but abstraction and the abstraction through the soundscapes that I, I also provide several uh, sound walks, one, one or two sound walks. And these are the the soundscapes of Chinatown, because this, uh, this gallery is in Chinatown, Manhattan. So these are basically cutouts extracted or um, used from the whole archive of prints that I, I, I developed during the residency. The residency was during a year, lasted a year. So in this case, I really like the roughness of the animation um, and also in connection with the idea of holding this memento, this photograph, this photo archive um, as a memento that were part of a, of a larger body that keep evolving into uh, different iterations. So for now, um, be, for me showing right now, walking in lightness at Sur Gallery, it's extremely meaningful because it's also speaking again back to why I am in Canada. I think right now um, in Montreal, I'm experiencing the same process that I was questioning a few years ago in New York, but all the time in Chicago. Although I think um, as Gloria Dalsua said, we are um, hybrids and I, I am a hybrid. I'm right now, I am, I'm, um, a Latinx that experiences many questions of identity, but it renders this identity to many different forms of um, um, exposure. And right now here in Canada and specifically in Montreal, 
the new exposure to language is 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 very meaningful and um, also very um as at times very alienating but i think this is part of me being um a constant immigrant in different spaces which the uh, film essay that it right now is exhibiting in, in the exhibition is um, basically um, exposing or is basically relating to. And so thank you. I hope if you are in Toronto, you can visit the exhibition and you can see the other pieces and the other ways of approaching this topic. Thank you so much for uh, your time and I'm passing the, the microphone to Tamara. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda.